Welcome back to Linear Algebra. I'm Dr. Jeff Burrow. Today, we're going to talk about isomorphisms. There are many kinds of morphisms in mathematics. We have homomorphisms, homeomorphisms, endomorphisms, automorphisms, all kinds of morphisms. And they come in the form of isomorphisms as well, which gives you the same structure, the exact same structure between objects. There are different kinds of isomorphisms. There are vector space isomorphisms, and that's what we are interested in here. There are also group isomorphisms, ring isomorphisms, field isomorphisms, etc., 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 depending upon the kind of structure that you are looking at. With a group isomorphism, you have preserved the group operation. In a vector space isomorphism, the structure should be the same in terms of both vector addition and scalar multiplication, since there are those two operations. So it pertains to the kinds of operations that you're dealing with as to what is preserved in an isomorphism. First, some definitions. A function f, mapping some domain into some set, is called 1, 2, 1, and that's sometimes written as a 1 hyphen 1, usually in parentheses like this, or 1 to 1 is also called an injection. If, whenever x1 does not equal x2, then f of x1 does not equal f of x2. So different domain elements map to different range elements. A function f mapping some domain into some set is called onto or a surjection if for each y in the set S there exists x in the domain D such that f of x equals y. So for a surjection, the entire codomain is the range. A function f, mapping some domain into some set, is called a bijection. if it is both one-to-one -one and onto. Suppose that I have both white sheep, I know, what a drawing, and black sheep. How do I know that I have the same number? What I do is I form a mapping. This one goes to this one, this one goes to this one, and this one goes to this one. Note that this mapping is one to one, and onto. It is a bijection. When I form a bijection like this, 
I know I have the same number of sheep. If I eliminate one of the black sheep, the only possible mapping now might be onto, but certainly not one-to-one. -one. You can see that we don't have a bijection anymore. It is a surjection, but not a bijection or an injection. On the other hand, if we eliminate one of the white sheep and put back one of the black sheep, it's no longer possible to have a function that is onto. We can find one that is one-to-one -one or injective, but not surjective in this case. There are too few white sheep to form a surjection. Very young children form bijections with their fingers. Suppose that I have two pens. I know there are two because I can make a bijection between the pens and two fingers. As an example, consider a linear transformation that maps R2 to R2 using matrix A, that is 2 by 2, of the form LA of X equals A times X. Let's suppose that this is equal to B for some B. Under what conditions does this have a unique solution? For all B, if and only if the matrix A is invertible. A is non-singular. Determinant of A is not zero, in other words. Because the solution X is unique for each different B, you can't have two X's that map to the same B. In other words, different X's map to different B's. This kind of mapping is one-to-one. -one. Consider a mapping from R3 into R2. A will have to be 2 by 3. Let's think about the dim dome theorem in relation to such a linear transformation. First of all, the dimensions of the range is no bigger than 2, since the codomain has dimension 2. Also, the dimension of the domain is 3. That implies that the nullity, which is the dimension of the null space, is at least 1. The null space does not consist only of the zero vector in this situation since the null space is at least one-dimensional. That means you have a bunch of different vectors mapping to zero. At least a one-dimensional subspace of the domain maps to the zero vector in the range. This function cannot be one-to-one. -one. In our next example, consider LA which maps R2 into R3, given by the matrix A, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What about this? Is this 1 to 1? Well, let's find out. We know that the dimension of the domain is 2. One thing we can say is that the rank 
can be no bigger than 2 since the rank plus the nullity equals the dimension of the domain by the dim dumb theorem. If the rank is less than or equal to 2, it can't be on 2 because the codomain has dimension 3. The range has dimension less than or equal to 2. So you can map R2 into R3 in this way using such a matrix. You can get a subspace in the codomain of dimension 2 or less, a plane, a line, or a single point, the origin. In this case, it's pretty easy to see that the rank is 2. We can perform elementary row operations to get the reduced row echelon form and see that the number of leading ones is 2. By the dim dumb theorem, we know that the nullity is 0. The dimension of the null space is 0. So we know this is not onto a linear transformation of this kind cannot take a two-dimensional space and map it onto all of R3. Can't happen. It's not onto. Is it one-to-one? -one? Knowing that the range is exactly two-dimensional, let's prove that it is one-to-one. -one. I'll show you how. Keep in mind that the rank is 2. Dim dumb implies nullity is 0, since the dimension of the domain is 2. And that implies that the null space consists only of the 0 vector in R2. Now, suppose that LA of x, 1, has the same value as LA of x, 2. Suppose it's not 1 to 1. What does that imply about x1 and x2? Well, let's find out. This implies that LA of x1 minus LA of x2 is the zero vector in R3 in the codomain. But this is a linear transformation, which implies LA of x1 minus x2 is zero. But wait a minute, the null space only consists of the zero vector in R2. The only thing that maps to the zero in the codomain is the zero in the domain. That implies x1 minus x2 is the zero vector in R2, and moving the x2 over, that tells us that x1 equals x2. The only way you can have things map to the same y value is if the x values are the same. That means this function is a one to one. The method that we used in showing the linear transformation in the last example as one to one seems like it would work more generally. Let's make it into a theorem. Let V and W be vector spaces. And T maps V into W linear. It's a linear transformation. And T is 1 to 1 if and only if the null space of T is trivial, consists only of the zero vector in V. The proof requires an implication in both directions since this is an if and only if statement. So let's suppose T is one to one. Also, suppose that T of U is the zero vector in W. Now, we now T of the zero vector in V is the zero vector in W by a previous theorem. 
And that implies, because we're assuming this is one to one, that u is the zero vector in v. That means the null space of t consists only of the zero vector in v. In going the other way, we'll suppose that the null space of t consists only of the zero vector in v. Also, suppose that t of x1 equals t of x2. We'll do the same trick we just did. We'll move one term over to get the zero in w. And then use the property of linearity to combine this as t of x1 minus x2. Since the null space is trivial, that implies x1 minus x2 is the zero vector in v, and that implies x1 equals x2. So you can't have different x values go to the same y value. That means t is 1 to 1, and the proof is over. In the next theorem, we show that if you have a 1 to 1 linear transformation, and it's acting on a basis, then the image of that basis in the codomain gives you a basis for the range. If V and W are vector spaces, and T, that's V under W, is one to one. In other words, it's an injection And V equals V1 through Vn is a basis for V, then the following set, T of V1 through T of Vn is a basis not for w, but for the range of t. After all, in other words, when you have a linear transformation that's one to one, the image, the range, can't have dimensions smaller than the domain or larger. It has to have a range of exactly the same dimension as the domain vector space. To prove that the collection of vectors t of v1 through t of vn forms a basis for the range, we have to prove a couple things. We have to prove that it's linearly independent and that it spans the range. A basis being a linearly independent spanning set. Let's prove that it spans first. Let y and the range of t. What does that mean to be in the range? That means there's something in the domain such that t of x equals y. But wait a minute. We have a basis for the range. implies then that y is t of x, which is t of c1 v1 to c and vn, but by the linearity property we get c1 of t of v1 to cn of t of vn, which implies that y is in the span of t of v1 through t of vn. That means if you're in the range, then you are in the span. The span of these vectors covers the entire range. <laughs>
Now we need to show that the set is linearly independent. Suppose not. Suppose that we have a linear transformation C1 T of V1 plus Cn T of Vn. Now, that's equal to T of C1 V1 through Cn Vn by the property of linearity. By our last theorem, since T is assumed to be one to one, its null space must be trivial. So we deduce that the zero in V is C1 V1 through C and Vn. But remember, V1 through Vn are a basis for the domain space V, which means they are linearly independent. And that implies C1 equals C2 equals all of these through Cn are zero. And that implies that these other vectors are linearly independent. Since it's both linearly independent and it spans the range, we deduce that it forms a basis for the range. Since the span of T of V1 through T of Vn is equal to the range of T, and the set T of V1 through T of Vn is linearly independent, it is a basis for the range. Now, as you've seen with our discussion of white sheep and black sheep, just having a one-to-one -one function isn't enough to even have a notion of number. It has to be both one-to-one -one and onto, a bijection. What do we mean by a linear transformation. We have a special name for linear transformations that are bijective, both one-to-one -one and m two. Those are going to be called vector space isomorphisms. Isomorphisms generally have to preserve the operators, by which we mean if you have t of u plus v, you get t of u plus t of v, and t of some constant a times u will be a times t of u. That preserves this concept of scalar multiplication and vector addition in the domain versus the range. So linear transformations are morphisms, in particular they're what is called a homomorphism, a vector space homomorphism. If we had only a group operation, like only plus but not scalar multiplication, then it would be a group homomorphism. A bijective homomorphism is called an isomorphism. In our next theorem, let's consider a linear transformation LA mapping Rn to Rn, that means A is an element of the space of n by n matrices, square matrices. La is an isomorphism if and only if A is invertible. singular. 
determinant not zero, etc., etc. We've seen this already in a sense. We know that this linear transformation is one to one if and only if the null space is trivial. For a square matrix to have a trivial null space associated with the linear transformation involving that, we're assuming LA of x is A times x. This will have trivial null space if and only if A is invertible. So we kind of already know the proof. It's over. One of the important programs of this course has been to show that every finite dimensional vector space behaves essentially like Rn. First, a definition. We say that vector spaces B and W are isomorphic. Seems to be implying they have the same form, the same shape, the same structure. They behave in exactly the same way if there exists an isomorphism T mapping V to W or the other way around between them. So vector spaces are isomorphic if they have the same structure. There's a one-to-one -one and onto mapping between them, very much like our sheep. How do you know how many sheep you have? You have to make bijections, one-to-one -one and onto mappings between the collections of sheep. If you can form a bijection between collections of sheep, then they have the same number of elements in each collection. In this case, we require a little more. We require that these vector space isomorphisms preserve the notion of vector addition and of scalar multiplication. And if it is also bijective, we can kind of think of these two spaces as having the same structure, the same form, as being morphically the same. They are isomorphic. In our next theorem, we're going to suppose that the dimension of some vector space is equal to 10, then V is isomorphic to Rn. Every finite dimensional vector space is the same, has the same structure as some Rn. This will complete an important aspect of our program, that every vector space is essentially Rn if it is finite dimensional. Not necessarily true for infinite dimensional vector spaces, but surely for finite dimensional vector spaces. In our proof, we'll use our coordinate function to establish the isomorphism between our vector space and Rn. So let V1 through Vn be a basis for V. Consider L of V equal to the coordinates of V relative to the basis. Then the coordinates are the coefficients C1 through Cn that allow us to construct V as a linear combination of these basis elements. That means the coordinates of V relative to V are elements of Rn. That means that L maps the vector space V into Rn. Is it a linear transformation? We've already seen that L of AV plus W which are the coordinates of AD plus W relative to B, 
will in fact satisfy a times the coordinates of v relative to b plus the coordinates of w relative to b. Therefore, L is linear. It's a linear transformation. It's a linear transformation from the vector space V into the vector space Rn. But is it an isomorphism? We need to show that L is one-to-one -one and onto. To see that it is onto, choose something in Rn, and then find something that maps to it, showing that it gets mapped to, it is in the range. We get the coordinates of V relative to B, which are these coefficients. And that implies for any C1 through Cn, that is in the range of the linear transformation L. That implies L is onto. We have only to show that L is one to one. To do that, we show that the null space is trivial by our previous theorem. This is the zero in Rn. It has core coordinates zeros all. That implies V is zero times V1 to zero times Vn. But if you rescale vectors by zero, you get zero, the zero in the domain space V. That implies that the null space of L consists only of the zero vector, and that implies L is one to one. Since it is both one to one and onto, it is a bijection, which means that L is an isomorphism. And that implies V and Rn are isomorphic. Consider the vector space of polynomials of degree two or less and R3. Remember, the vector space of polynomials of degree two or less look like A plus BX plus CX squared, where A, B, and C are elements of a set of real numbers as far as we are concerned in this course. We're only dealing with real vector spaces. We could take A, B, and C to be complex numbers, but let's not do that here. In this case, since A, B, and C are all in R, they have three free parameters, just like the coordinates in R3. The dimension of P2 is 3, the same as R3. That means these vector spaces are isomorphic. We can form a linear transformation. And this will be our isomorphism. Things in R3 like this will behave much like things in P2 like this. When you add vectors like this, you get a vector like this. When you add polynomials like this, you add the corresponding coefficients the same way you would add the corresponding coefficients in R3. You get exactly the same kind of algebra in P2 as you do in R3 the same exact structure because of the equivalence of co corresponding coefficients in different polynomials of degree two or less. Suppose F maps some domain into a set. Let R of F be the range 
say that g, mapping the range of f into the domain, is an inverse of f if the following two properties hold. If we take g composed with f of x and get x, and two, f composed with g of x gives us x. Whatever f does, g sends it back. Whatever g does, f sends it back. So the picture is something like this. If f takes x into something, g will take it directly back and vice versa. You might have noticed that we are a little cagey here. We're defining what it means for a function to be an inverse function. But we've said an inverse function, implying that maybe there's more than one. We'll prove that if the inverse does exist, then there's only one. Inverse functions are unique. The proof is like all uniqueness proofs. Assume there are two of something, and then show they have to be equal. So let g and h be inverses of f. What does that mean then? Then f of g of x is x. But that's also f of h of x. Now, this has to equal this. Let's take g of both of those. Let's take g of both of those. We can rewrite this as g composed with f composed with g of x, and g composed with f, composed with h of x. Since g of f cancels out and just leaves the input, we get g of x over here, and g of x cancels here, so we get h of x. And this is true for all x. So that's the end of the proof. The uniqueness of inverse functions allows us to introduce a notation. If g is the unique inverse function of f, we write, instead of g, with a superscript of negative 1. We have to be a little careful about this notation, and that's because this notation of a superscript of 1 has two distinct meanings that are very different from each other. One is superscripts of negative 1 often mean 1 over, but that's not what we mean here. What we mean here, if it's in the context of a function, is that it runs the function backwards. It reverses the rules of x and y. So one notation, two distinct meanings. It requires a contextual interpretation. We interpret which meaning is appropriate based on the context. This is one of the reasons why mathematics is hard. We do have contextual interpretation of meaning because sometimes one notation can represent two different concepts. Remember that all notation in mathematics is conventional it's by agreement, arbitrary choices based on some agreement. Therefore, that means that a lot of mathematical notation cannot be, none of it, can be arrived at through pure logic. All of it must be arrived at by instruction.
It follows then that f inverse of f of x, which is by definition f inverse of f of x, is x. And f composed with f inverse of x, which is by definition f of f inverse of x, is also x. You should remember that a relation is any set of ordered pairs. So for example, if I have something that looks kind of like this filled in, that's just a collection of points in the plane, that is a relation. It's not a function. Functions have to satisfy the vertical line test. Functions can't output two distinct y values for one given x value. Also, recall a function f has an inverse function if and only if it is That's not true for relations. Every relation has an inverse relation. All you have to do is reverse the coordinates, x and y. As an example, Suppose I give you y equals x squared. That's a perfectly good function. f of x equals x squared. The inverse relation, which does exist, reverses the roles of x and y. So it reflects the curve through the line y equals x. So this is the inverse relation. But the inverse relation is not a function because it does not satisfy the vertical line test. That's because the original function did not satisfy the horizontal line test for whether or not it is one to one. You have two distinct x values that have exactly the same y value, different x mapping to the one y. It's not one to one. So it does not have an inverse. It's inverse, not a function. Every relation has an inverse relation, but not every function has an inverse function. A function has an inverse function, if and only if it is one-to-one. -one. Concerning linear transformations, remember that linear transformations are functions, and they will have an inverse, if and only if they are one-to-one. -one. The question is, is the inverse of a linear transformation that is one-to-one, -one. also a linear transformation. Is the inverse a linear transformation? Let T be a one-to-one -one linear transformation. It's one-to-one. -one. T inverse does exist, and it's unique. Then T inverse is a linear transformation. We have to prove that the inverse function satisfies the properties of a linear transformation. Let u and v be in the range of t. What does it mean to be in the range? Then there exists let's say x and y, such that t of x equals u and t of y equals v. This implies then that x 
is T inverse of U, and Y is T inverse of V. Also, T of X plus Y by the linearity is T of X plus T of Y, which is U plus V. That implies then that T inverse of U plus V is X plus Y. Wait a minute. There's something going on here. T inverse of U plus V. It equals X plus Y, but X was T inverse of U. And Y was T inverse of V. That gives us the first property of linearity. One property to go. Also, AU is A times T of X, which is T of AX, which implies then that AX is T inverse of AU. But remember what X is. X is T inverse of U. That proves the second property of linearity. In our next theorem, suppose LA maps Rn to Rn, LA of X is A times X, and A inverse exists. Then the inverse transformation is A inverse times X. To prove this, let's give it a shot. A inverse times A is the identity matrix, and so we end up with just X. A times A inverse is the identity matrix giving us X. The fact that these compositions both gave us X implies that A inverse times X is in fact the inverse. And so we're done. For example, let's suppose LA maps R2 to R2 where A is the matrix, let's say, 3, 1, to 1. A inverse is 1 over the determinant. Switch the diagonals and negate the off diagonals. Then L inverse of A will be 1, negative 1, negative 2, 3 times a vector x in R2. We already know that every n-dimensional vector space is isomorphic to Rn. What you should also know is that every n-dimensional vector space is isomorphic to every other n-dimensional vector space. That ought to be a transitive law, right? In fact, we will use a kind of transitive property here. In our proof, let's say phi map V into Rn and psi maps W into Rn the isomorphisms. That means bijective linear transformations.
sine inverse can close with phi. The domain will be the domain of phi. And the codomain will be the domain, since we're running this backwards, of psi. Since each of these functions is one-to-one, -one, their inverses are also one-to-one. -one. And when you compose one-to-one -one functions, you get a one-to-one -one function. So this will be one-to-one. -one. And since we have an inverse of a linear transformation, that is also a linear transformation. And when you compose linear transformations, you get a linear transformation. So this will be a linear transformation that is also one-to-one, -one, therefore an isomorphism. That's it. In our next example, I want to construct an isomorphism from P2, the vector space of polynomials of degree 2 or less, to the vector space of symmetric 2 by 2 matrices. Pretty easy to do. We'll just take a plus bx plus cx squared and map it onto a, b, b, c, a symmetric matrix. This will be one-to-one -one because it has a trivial null space. The only way you can output 0, 0, 0, 0 is if all the coefficients a, b, and c are 0, which means the polynomial in the domain space is the 0 polynomial. That gives you the null space of L consists only of the zero polynomial. That means L is one to one. Also, it's easy to check that this is a linear transformation. I'll let you do that. We've seen now that every finite dimensional vector space is isomorphic to Rn for some n. Also, all n-dimensional vector spaces are isomorphic to each other. They're basically the same as far as their vector space structures are concerned. There might be additional structures that you could impose on those vector spaces, giving them structures beyond just being a vector space. For instance, when I'm looking at polynomials, I can multiply two polynomials in a commutative way, P1 times P2 equals P2 times P1, and get a polynomial. How do you do that with vectors in Rn? There's no clear way to do that I suppose you could invent a way. But there are some additional structures that you can impose on the vector space of polynomials that give it more algebraic content. We haven't said anything about the equivalence of those additional structures. When we're talking about vector space isomorphisms, we're only looking at the vector space structures.